All right, Maddie. Yeah. Maddie, where are you from originally? Where'd you grow up? I grew up in Walnut Creek, California. Up north? Yeah, Bay Area. And tell me about your childhood. You had both your parents when you were young? Mm, well, I'm adopted and I was taken at birth. And um, so I went into foster care and my, um, I was hit throughout foster care. So when my adopted mom got me. Originally, there was a couple that came along and wanted to adopt me, but I was too sick. I had ear infections that were killing me. And when my adopted mom got me, um, she um, took me into the doctors and got me surgery on my ears because I needed tube replacements. Um, so um, I dealt with um, being a traumatized child from the beginning of birth. From your first foster family? Yeah, I, w I think I went from foster family to foster family. I think I was in like maybe five to ten different homes as even before I was even two because I kept coughing all the time. And instead of like taking me to doctors, they would just hit me to shut me up. So eventually you ended up with a family that was stable and... Um, I ended up getting, they put me, I was in a, like, look, they were looking for a family to adopt me. And a lot of, like the first family didn't want to adopt me because I was sick. I was so sick and they said, oh, a sick child, we don't want this child. And then um, after that, um, I, I, my mom, my adopted mom came along and um, she, she adopted me because she really loved babies, but she didn't love like the part of the person growing up because it was her losing control. She wanted to feel wanted. But um, she, she adopted me, took me to the doctor, got my ears fixed, and I, um, I was deaf until I was about two. So I had no speech, no hearing, no nothing. I just kind of, I learned it really late. So in school, I went to speech for about eight years. And um, I couldn't say things like basic words like computer or napkin or napkin or um, paper towels or you know, it was just a re. It was, it was a fresh start to learn how to talk, but just late. Um, and then um, she raised me um, as a single mother, adopted me as a single mother. Um, at the time, I had two parents, but he wasn't actually my parent. He was just around when I was adopted, so he became like my father. He was my father, though. He wasn't my adopted father or my blood father, but he was family. And um, family is really important to me. Um, I remember that after um, I was probably like five years old, my mom kicked him out because he was an alcoholic because she wanted to control him. My mom had severe control issues. And so um, I went through like the abandonment of two parents separating. And uh, that was really, really difficult for me. Um, and then after that, I was, um, my mom, had, like these two guys came to our house and was like, this guy has nowhere to stay. Can he stay with you? And that was the beginning of my childhood rape. Um, I went four years of being starved, four years of being hit with a metal bar, four years of being hit with a horse whip, four years of sexually mis um, rape, sexual rape, four years of being locked in a room, four years of being tied to a bed, four years of just childhood trauma that can't be taken back but it's made me who I am today. Um, it got, my mom ended up finding someone she wanted to marry. And um, with this guy, I just remember I would be, he, w he treated me like I was a doll to him. Like I was something he could put in the bathtub and shave my legs, um, get angry and hit me when he wanted. Um, he would, he would like, do all kinds of nasty sexual play. After I was done with like, even before school, like remember before kindergarten, he'd take me to the gas station and he would like pick up magazines of trans women and, show, and trans men and show me at that age 
And he showed me what my first vibrating dildo was at five. I remember I walked into school and I was telling other kids what a vibrator was, like a dildo, because I didn't understand why I would get in trouble. And I went in and they said, you can't say that kind of stuff or I'll have to suspend you. But like, where were the teachers thinking? Like, why would a kid be saying that? Did they ask any questions? And I remember I went to school one day and I told the teacher, hey, look, I'm being, I'm being touched. I'm being hit. And they checked my body and they didn't see any bruises. So they had sent me home with the guy that was doing it to me. And that guy ended up telling me, and if I told anybody, that he would take my mom and me, hang me from a tree, cut her open in front of me, and then cut me open. And I would have to watch her bleed. Um, this, this was your adopted mom's boyfriend? What? Yeah. This, this was just the beginning. And this, this started, the After, sexual part of it started when you were about five? Probably like the beginning of five, four, five. Um, so I went from that to my stepdad moving in, whole new guy, right? And um, I remember that he wasn't a bad guy, um, but tension started because I remember that the first night was great, but after that first guy, that, the guy that abused me, my mom brought around, I promised myself I would always hate my stepdad. I'd always hate him. I always look like at him as he's evil, as he's a bad man. And um, he wasn't a bad man. But I learned as old, I got older, my mom manipulated me in his situation to see it as something it wasn't because she would get jealous that he would take me out shopping and it wasn't her. And she'd pick fights between us. And it was manipulating because we both didn't see it that way. And I realized if I had given him a chance and that hadn't happened, he would be different in my life. But it came to the point where it was like, I made him so angry and he made me so angry, he'd get violent with me. Like, I remember in elementary school, he would pick me up and push me against the wall and shake me. And um, I told the school and they told him he can't do that anymore, so he stopped. Um, and I went from that to like, um, him looking down my shirt and I was afraid like, maybe he would rape me or maybe he would poison me because he wanted my mom. And I just experienced a lot of jealousy between my stepdad and my mom. And um, I, I think my mom was married with him for 14 years. And when I was 12, um, when I was 12, the guy that was at the house that treated me like his daughter, not the rapist, I, I, when I was in the house, they were selling drugs out of it. It was a drug house, um, especially um, and I remember this one guy, he was, he wasn't, he was pretty sober. He smoked cigarettes and, um, he took care of me. He showed me my first computer, what Nickelodeon was. We'd go outside and like, I was a kid. I loved insects. I liked to collect butterflies and, and, um, ladybugs. What kid doesn't? And I remember when I was 12, I remember that I got a call from the cops. My mom did. And I was in the car and they said to me that he had killed himself. And I remember that I asked myself, I always loved him. Why wouldn't he come and tell me that he like cared about me? I would have been there for him. I would have always cared about him. I was always, I've always been and still am the girl with the good heart that would be there for a friend in an instant if they were fucked up or trying to kill themselves or commit suicide. I would be that one person. I'd run a mile to like get on a plane just to fly to them. But. I just remember like I couldn't believe the one person that took care of me through all that trauma was gone. So that was really, that was really f just m made me upset. Um, and after that, um, my mom started taking in like people that were like homeless and that like couldn't take care of themselves and then wouldn't take care of themselves. My mom thought she could fix them. Every guy that she's ever brought around has been more important than her daughter. And she felt like she could fix them. She could fix anybody. And what she wasn't realizing is she was damaging her own daughter. She adopted me for whatever reasons to not care that I was special, not care that I had needs, not care that I was a human, a person living in this world from a young child. And those men that she was bringing around 
were damaging me, hurting me in ways that no child, no, no child at all should go through rape. No child at all should go through abuse. No child at all should be neglected from their food or their rib cages showing. I, any child, not a foster care child, not children deserve better. And adults sometimes deserve better. But it, after, after the whole situation with um, him killing himself, my childhood rape, childhood past, um, and my stepdad, um, by the time I was 14, um, I was, well, even before that, um, I was on online dating sites because I didn't feel safe to be in my own home at this point. I was jumping from house to house, sleeping at random people's house just so I felt safe. I felt safe with a random more, I felt more safe with a random person than I did at my own home. And then one time I got on there and I started looking to seek help from like finding somebody to sleep at their house. I was kidnapped for a week. The guy drugged me up. He was gonna take me to Mexico. And then the cop showed up at his house and said, we tracked you, where is this girl at? They asked me if they knew the girl, because obviously they knew that he had taken me. And then he dropped me off in front of my house and I went inside and crawled in bed because I, I was on Oxycontin. He drugged me up. I'd never been on drugs before. I'd never done weed, I'd never drinking. He gave me Oxycontin and he gave me Xanax. And I just remember I passed out and he was having sex with me and he was probably like 27 years old and I was 14. And um, I just remember being gone for a week and being drugged up and being out of it. And um, it was hard. Um, and then after that, I went to a boarding school, a wilderness program. My parents sent me away. They woke me up at five, 3 a.m. in the morning to two big black women, a uh, black woman and a black man coming in and taking me at 3 a.m. in the morning. And all I could think is, why are two people taking me early in the morning? Uh, it wouldn't even matter what color they are, like, could be two big white people and I'd be scared. Like, I just got, I just got kidnapped and my mom's paying three, my, my mom's paying these people to come take me. And I'm like thinking, <clears throat> who the fuck is she, who is she paying <clears throat> to come take me at 3 a.m. in the morning? I thought I was gonna be sex trafficked at that point. Like my parents were conned or something. So I'm waking up at 3 a.m. in the morning, taken to a white van, like those vans you call the sex trafficking vans, the pedophile vans, put in there and get told I'm taking, being put on a plane and going somewhere. They wouldn't tell me where. And I'm thinking to myself like, fuck, what's gonna happen with my life? Well, I ended up in a wilderness program. About six months of that, I was outdoors, I backpacked, I hiked, I went trailing and I loved it all actually. I didn't want to leave. I didn't want to go back to society. I didn't want to be a part of society. I loved being outdoors so much that I felt at home. I was nice. And so I did that and then I went to a boarding school and I uh, would run from these boarding schools because I felt forced to be somewhere I didn't want to be. I don't let people force me to be where I don't want to be. It's not who I am. I'm my own goddamn person. And um, so I just ran away. Um, I guess after these boarding schools, I, um, well, I ended up, what I was going to say is I ended up taking um, a car. I was, uh, I ran away from the boarding school. I ended up um, finding someone's house that wasn't there and I went and took their car and I drove back to California from Idaho because I felt that I'd never driven a car before. I didn't have any directions. I didn't have a map. I didn't, have an, I didn't even know I could navigate, but I just got in a car and I drove it. I drove it back to California. 
hour away from getting where I wanted to go, I was almost to freedom. I got caught. I got pulled over and they were like, hey, we have to take you to juvie. And I was honest, I was like, I don't have a permit or anything. And I was like, okay, well, you can arrest me now because I'm not supposed to be driving this car. And um, so I went to juvie and then my parents were like, we gotta come get her. She's supposed to be at a boarding school. Brought me back up there and I tried to run again. Like when the, the spot was, when I got to a gas station, I tried to run again. I didn't get away. But then the detective actually, um, they asked me to bring me down to the police station because they needed me to talk to a detective. And so I went down to the police station and I told them the honest truth. And then when it went to court, I was just honest about it. I, I and the, co the, the judge actually looked at me and was like, why are your parents putting you in a boarding school? You're way too smart for this. It's like, you can get out of and do something like that. We don't really hear about cases like this. It's very rare that a, that we have an intelligent girl that can out that can do that kind of stuff. And maybe your parents shouldn't be putting you in programs like this because we don't need like cases like this. It's just, um, so uh, after that, I went down to a lockdown facility. It was called Cinnamon Hills. And um, they were really disturbing. They, I feel like that what they did was like rape. They would take these kids once a month, these girls and these guys, I think it was the girls, I don't know about the guys who separate us, but they take us into a doctor and they would like say that we needed inspections every month. And they'd stick their, the doctor would say stuff like, oh, here comes the rubber ducky, spread your legs to, from east to west. I'm gonna stick my fingers up you now. Every month he would penetrate our vaginas with his fingers and feel around. And it was creepy and weird. And they wouldn't let us go see a normal doctor. We had to see the one that they chose for us. We're allowed to go off for maybe just the dentist. Um, but it was crazy. And then, what was I gonna say? Um, I think that was like being there, they would like had a lot of mentally ill people. And um, I was not one of them. I would watch people do crazy stuff, but I would be quiet and just watch it and observe. If you got in trouble though, they would like take you and rip your arms out. It was basically like this. And they'd bend you over till you scream and you pee yourself. And they'd scream in your face and traumatize each person. These were underage children they were doing this to. This was in Utah. And they would just scream in your face. And these people are here for trauma, but they would use that against them. And so I was like really bad to see that. That's the way that people treat people. Like, and, the, and whoever was running that would allow that to happen. Um, but as I graduated from that school, I went to another school and started doing better. Um, the one thing that was crazy is that since I was like five, um, my teacher said, oh, she's ADHD, put her on meds. So they put me on Adderall. I think it was actually at four years old. I was on Adderall and it really mentally messed me up really early. And then I went on like from med to med to med to med to med. Every med had a negative side effect. My mom never listened to me about like how that affected me. It was really awful. And so I finally, when I was out of the boarding schools and I went through all that shit, I ended up taking myself off of it. And I remember that feeling of, I actually felt like I was myself. I was a person, I haven't been on meds since. I don't touch drugs, I don't touch meds. I like being who I am, I'm comfortable with myself. And I feel confident within myself because I don't let anything control me that doesn't need to control me. Not a person, not drugs, not people. I am able to do what I wanna do in life and know that I'm happy with myself. I could walk out with my hair all fucked up and not care what people have to say because it's me, I'm just me. Do you have a problem with that? That's your own problem. That's your own self projection. Maybe you're worried about how your hair will look out, but that doesn't mean I'm you. So that's how I was. And then 
after that boarding school, I came home and I met this guy named Harris. And he was working at the store, um, actually across from my store. You're how old now? I'm 20, I think I'm 20 years old. And I'm home and I'm working at Safeway. And this guy worked at Knob Hill. And um, it was crazy because he, we were friends. We weren't dating or anything. We we're like friends. And um, I remember going on these dates with him. Everything was fine. Um, I remember like in a relationship, relationship, at least I didn't think. Um, but I remember that he, he was really nice to me. I really liked him. And um, I remember that he invited me to go up to his parents' house. And at his parents' house, he forcefully raped me by sticking his dick down my throat. And he wouldn't stop. I pushed him off and he wouldn't stop. And like two years later, I think I was like 20, maybe 23, I found out he raped two other girls after me. Um, at the same time. And all those girls were afraid to say something. Well, honestly, it's like that, what that guy did was awful. After one girl, after another girl, after another girl. And now he's in the military, but honestly, like he doesn't deserve to be in doing anything. Like, I don't know. It's not my life though. But um, it was the first time that I really had PTSD I really was traumatized, fucked up. And I just couldn't, I couldn't, I was numb. I couldn't get a bed for six months. I couldn't, I couldn't live. I didn't feel like I could live, but I was living. I was damaged, but not unfixable damage, just damage to like where it affected me for a long time. I was sleepwalking. I was waking up traumatized. So waking up with nightmares that I was still in. I was uh, just so, so fucked up. Still, I sat there. I didn't take drugs to get over it. I sat there and I coped with it as well as I could. It's the first time I'd been raped since my childhood. And then I was brought back all the flashbacks of everything. Um, That didn't, I had, at the time, I ended up, uh, I was with somebody. I ended up getting with some, my ex, well, he was my ex-boyfriend because I dated him for four years from like 11 to 15. And then, so I ended up getting back with him and at the time and he ended up calling the cops or I did call the cops, but he stood by my side through it and like helped me through it and stuff. And I just remember that um, um, after that was over, I remember I ended up getting drunk for the first time with him and his friend. Um, their names were Colby and Dylan. And um, ended my, he ended up putting Adderall in my alcohol and drugged me. Um, 14 years of knowing someone, maybe a little less, you're supposed to trust them. The one the person that sucked through the rape case with me, not even the case, I didn't go to court or anything, but ended up raping me and his friend raped me. And the only reason I knew is because I woke up with fingertips on my legs and handprints, palm prints on my hips from that. I'll never forget that the one person I loved, the one person I cared about, one person I was in a relationship with, the one person I trusted, did what he did and just acted like it never happened and went on with his life. Like, it wasn't even that he acted like it didn't happen. He knew he was guilty and couldn't say sorry and own up to it because he's a fucking coward. And 
that's all I see in that person is like, he knew I loved him. And when we broke up, I wasn't willing to go back to being his girlfriend right away. So he lost his power, so he had to get his power back by raping me, by abusing me. Wanted power over me. And I know that Colby, I heard, went to parties and raped people, but the other guy wasn't like that. It maybe influenced him to do it or something. I don't know. But all I do know is that it was, it was bad. Because I went from one rape to another, but the next rape was my best friend. But after that, I, I ended up feeling like I was stronger and that I could move on faster that time. Maybe I just was so damaged by the first one that the second one wasn't as bad. But after that, I, um, I ended up, um, I think, getting with someone else for about three years, like two and a half. And I fell in love with that guy and he was, his name was Steven. He was a really good guy, had a lot of problems. I accepted those problems, but it was like, he lied too much. He couldn't be honest. It didn't matter how much I tried to work with him. He just, his self got in the way. So after three years, we broke up. I got with someone else, which I was with for a month, but I think it was a month or two. And the first time I've known this guy, um, because the other guy, I didn't think I could get, like we were, I wasn't using birth control. We weren't using condom for three years. And um, he, he didn't get me pregnant. So I thought maybe I'm infertile. Maybe, because he said he wasn't infertile, so I thought I was infertile. And then I came to find out in my next relationship on the first night I got pregnant, I was definitely fertile. There's nothing wrong with me. And um, I told him, like, when we had sex, like, we, there's a possibility I could get pregnant. You probably should use a condom, but if you don't want to, fine. Well. I ended up getting pregnant and he ran. And he was like, I wouldn't mind getting you pregnant. And then that's how that started. So it's like, I made a stupid decision. And, but now I have a daughter. So my daughter is fucking great. But besides the point, um, he ran. He was never there for me during my pregnancy. He abandoned me. He, I remember he came to the sonogram and he told me that he wishes he had given me a plan B after seeing his daughter alive and moving. He wished that he had never, he wished he had killed her after seeing life. I saw it in my head like, you're sick. But I just let that slide. I didn't really like say much to it because there wasn't much to say to that, but I, um. After that, I found out that my dad was dying from cancer. Um, he had stage four pancreatic cancer. And then after that, I was kicked out by my mom. She left a note on the door saying that you're no longer welcome back here at six months pregnant. Love ya, not I love you, love ya. If you need any, she wouldn't even let me get my stuff. I had to call the cops to go back up and get some few items that I needed. And, um, She blamed me for her divorce, which she caused herself. She controlled his money. She, she dug herself a hole. And on top of that, he wasn't happy. He cheated on her with her high school friend, which wasn't okay on his part either. They both did wrong, but they didn't communicate or talk about it. And it was like horrible. But I remember, I remember I was standing up for my mom so hardcore, literally not seeing that she was manipulated. It took me getting kicked out to see the true, my true mom. So after that, it was like, I was kicked out. Now I'm six months pregnant, about to be homeless. She stole all my money, I had $3,000 saved up. Stole all my money and kicked me out. I was supposed to go to a homeless shelter. Don't have a ride there, don't have any clothes, don't have anything. Luckily, I was dating a guy 
for like a weekend. Him and his mom took me in. And um, I stayed with him for a while. Um, and it was really hard because I was very vulnerable. That guy did a lot of, that person did a lot of hurt. And um, I was gaslighted a lot. And I was raped and he said that it was because he was drunk and he couldn't remember. And I questioned that. Um, but I tried to talk to him about it later. And he just justifies it like nothing happened. So even talking to him about it, it couldn't do that. It was impossible. I mean, I loved the guy, but it was impossible. He helped deliver my baby, so, and took me in when I was homeless, so. Was it that I wanted to be there still, and, or was it that I felt entitled to be there because he's, he helped me out through the hardest moments? Like, I'm supposed to be loyal to people that help me out. But it was hard. Because I don't want to make him mad or make him feel upset, because it was always so bad. We'd have screaming matches. But I ended up getting my own place. And then um, I made the mistake of after that place, going back to my mom's house for a little bit. And I realized she got too much, so I packed up my stuff and I took a bus down to LA. I moved down to LA and I was down in LA for a while. And I didn't know if I was gonna place. I put my daughter in a car seat, packed two suitcases, got on a bus and left. Took a leap of faith into the unknown. I didn't know if it was gonna have place, didn't know what was gonna happen. But I had faith that like, I'd be okay. When I got there, I found a room for rent. And I made it. And now I got my permit for the first time. I have my own place now that no one can take from me. I just, I'm doing better than I ever have in my life. And I started, uh, I just started to feel safe, comfortable. And for the first time, I felt like I was at peace that I didn't have to worry about abusive boyfriends, bad friends, bad parents, because now I have the freedom to cut out anybody that doesn't serve my purpose in life. That was a goddamn, that was a blessing for me to realize I'm an adult and I have power over my life. And how old are you now? 24. 24. It took me 24 years. And everything I've ever done in my life, everything that's ever happened to me, I did it alone. Nobody was there for me. Not friends, not family, nobody. Maybe my friend Alyssa showed up at the hospital to help me, but through the pregnancy, and she's always kind of been there for me, but through the tough shit, I was alone. It seems like so many people in your life have let you down in different ways. There is one actually specific situation that was really fucked up more than anything. I think this was worse than rape. When I was, after um, I broke up with that guy, I got with a guy named Sam I um, He was really cool. He was a tattoo artist. I admired his art, thought it was beautiful. I thought he was a beautiful person. Um, I didn't know at the time of starting to date him that he was a meth and heroin addict. I I, uh, the only reason I found out was because he went over to a girl's house and I didn't know where he was. I thought he was cheating or something. Then he came back, he's like, no, I'm a functional drug addict. And I'm like, fuck, he rides a motorcycle, perfectly fine. He works a 40 hour job. I would never have known. Like I'm, I don't deal with people a lot that do drugs or I, I don't even deal with them. But it was crazy because 
I, I wouldn't have think that he could function like that, like someone on drugs can function, and he did a really good job functioning on drugs. And then I found out later that I was pregnant by him. I ended up, um, I ended up, um, I ended up getting a call from, a little cop showed up and told me I had to leave his property. I ended up getting a call from his lawyer. Basically his lawyer was trying to force an abortion on me. Trying to say they would take me to court to like force an abortion and, and then he would do all these say nasty things and then they're like, we'll pay you a lot of money. We'll pay for your abortion. We'll do this, we'll do that. Like, um, and it felt like my free will was taken away from me. But like, maybe that's what he wanted was to hurt me in that way. Cause maybe I had hurt him, but he wanted to really destroy me. So when I went through the abortion, um, I went through it alone. I remember that I saw the baby alive. The next minute I saw the baby dead. It was really traumatizing for me. I think that's the last traumatizing situation that I've been through. And I don't think that guy will ever, ever know damage he did to my life and him being a meth and heroin addict should know that things can fuck up your life and forever ruin it but instead he inflicted pain like someone did to him that caused him to take drugs except i will never do drugs because i'm stronger i don't need to fill a void just because i got hurt I don't need to hurt people when they actually helped me. And then at some point you got into the porn industry. Um, yeah, I, uh, I did. Um, nothing much to say there. It's just like porn isn't really real, like realistic. It's like, they do make a lot of money off of it, but the real thing is, it's like filming a movie, like the movie industry. Cut, take, cut, take, cut, take, cut, take. Pay the people, you know, just, just not like, it was pretty normal. Porn is like working a normal job, except I think it's like, get more praise than a normal job. You get more of money than a normal job. It's like one step down from being in an actual movie. That's how I feel about that. I've never been traumatized by porn. Never had anything bad happen. So, I mean, what, what is your view on the porn industry and, and how it, is it, is it good or bad for women or for people or men? Or well, women? like I, I was, um, I feel like um, porn empowers women, it's, uh, some women. Um, for some women, they have had abusive relationships, abusive families, and I feel like they come into porn and they're making money for a fresh start. It's not that they necessarily want to go have sex for money on camera. So that they realize that, hey, look, I can save money. I can have a fresh start. I can be on my own. I don't need this piece of boyfriend. I don't need this piece of family. I can literally save my money to build my life. I can build credit. I can save my money. And a lot of girls do spend their money, but if they were smart, they would save it. Save, save, save. Buy a house. Or buy their, get their own apartment to start. Build their credit. Work on getting their car if they don't have one. Try to get their permit, take driving classes so they can pass the driver's test. There's ways around things when you're suffocating. There's always resources. There's always people are willing to help. To be willing to communicate and don't be afraid to ask for help. But I do feel like porn can empower some women. There's some women that, that don't, it doesn't empower them. And maybe that wasn't meant for them. 
That's how I feel. Yeah, it's certainly a career not for everyone, not for every girl. No, definitely not. But you found it empowering to, to, to some extent. Mm, I found it kind of boring, <laughs> weirdly. I find that, it, yeah, it pays good, but I found that I really, at the end of the day, I get, I get kind of bored. Just because it's like, not that I don't enjoy, like, the times that I have to have sex, it's more like I, I feel like I, um, I just feel like, um, like it's another job I'm doing. Like, no. Like, there's this girl in the industry, her name's Emma. And, like, I really admire her because she set out goals to um, set aside her money, build her credit, get her first home on her own, put a pull in. Um, like, successfully do what she's doing, take pride into it, and look like she cares about herself. And it looks, if she's not happy, she at least looks happy. I don't know her too well. At least she looks like she's confident and happy. She's supporting herself. Wait, what? She's supporting herself. Yeah, and I really admire her, and I, I don't think, like, I know she's, she's probably a really guarded person, doesn't let people near her in. But to be honest, like I really like if I like ever got the chance to tell her like, hey, look, you're a really awesome person. I really admire you. I'd like to be a good friend to you. I could learn um, from you. I could really, you could really teach me uh, like things, and I would like to like be there for you as a person. Like, I remember there's days that she had bad days, and I text her, hey, how are you doing? Just because I'm I care about people, and I get worried, and I see her upset and I just want to be like, are you okay? You know, is everything okay? Because there's been girls in the industry that have killed themselves and I worry about anybody like, maybe some fans harassing her or maybe something's going on. I just want to be there for that person. It doesn't matter the person. Um, but I see, I admire her. That would be any girl in the porn industry. I'd be there for them, like no matter what. There's girls that I look after, I keep close eyes on. Not. Just because if they're having a bad day, they, they need someone to talk to, I'd be that one person to call them. If I had their number, I'd text them if I didn't on social media. But I think Emma's achieved a lot, and um, I think she's come a long way. And I, I, I think she's been in the industry for three years, and she, she's a really cool girl. So. So your view on the industry is, is that it's, it's okay? That yeah, I'm mutual about it. That's how I would say, I, my feelings are mutual. Neutral. Neutral, yeah. I don't have anything negative. I don't have like, I, like, I think the positive I've already said, but I don't really have anything negative to say. Um, I think the only degrading part about the industry is when there's directors that force girls to do things they don't want to do and won't pay them to go home. Because it's not in their contract. The contract we sign. So when they take advantage of the girls, and that's not what they're getting paid for. And that girl's uncomfortable and they're intimidating them because they know they're vulnerable. I don't like that. It's the only negative thing that I would say that's in the industry where I've heard from other girls that directors do do that. I haven't had that done. And if it was me, and someone tries to do that, I am gonna leave. Doesn't matter what you're paying me. So that's how I feel. And going through all this stuff that you went through, I mean, what, what, what do you feel is the most important lesson you've learned? A lot of the things that I went through aren't necessarily my fault, but as long as I can accept it, I can be comfortable with myself and move on. Things happen the way they do. You can't control them. You can breathe in the moment, tell yourself it's okay. Learn how to cope with it. Learn to move forward, be strong, get back up, and move on. Nothing's stopping you from being a better, bigger person going forward with your life. You have to choose to do that. Nobody else steps in your shoes at the end of the day. You choose to step in your shoes and make yourself go forward. All right, Maddie.
Well, thank you so much for sharing your story. Yeah, no problem. I wish you the best of luck. Thank you. Thank you very much.